It's that time again for another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm Phil, along with Logan and John today. We've changed the seasons officially, and it's a little cooler outside, frost on the ground, cat in the camera. It's just that time of year. This is episode number 213. Today's episode is brought to you by Epilogue Laser. Quickly and easily customize your woodworking projects for added beauty and value. Learn more at epiloguelaser.com. Now, to get things started on today's episode, uh, I believe that there are some congratulations in order for the popular woodworking staff on a recent wedding. Oh, yes. I was like, guys, what did we do? You guys like, all oh, got crap. Married? We did. Yeah. Yeah, we're moving to Utah, too. Good job. Good for you guys. Yeah. I'm happy. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Colin and I just got back from a combo trip. It was a trip of um, not only heading to um, Virginia for a three day photo shoot with two gentlemen. We shot six magazine features in two days. It was a long two days or three days. But we also beforehand, Colin and I both flew into um, Columbus, Ohio um and our designer danielle was getting married so we uh, i flew in saturday night fairly late um he got there sunday morning and we drove over to the wedding beautiful wedding absolutely beautiful like venue it was this like pole barn out in the middle of the country um in you know southern ohio colors were changing it was brisk outside but the sun was nice and warm it was lovely it was a great it was a great wedding so yeah so congratulations to daniel and chris on getting married so i think it's funny that their wedding vows and all the like speeches and stuff kept mentioning how much daniel will never shut up <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> at least they're going in with their eyes wide open yep it was funny like her dad was like you know because Danielle's a, a triplet. He's like, you know, Danielle was the last one born. She's the youngest. She came out and there was about a minute and a half that she wasn't making any noise because she was the last one. You know, she was, you know, little oxygen starved. He's like, that's the quietest she's ever been. He said, it's been <laughs> nonstop since that point. <laughs> it was awesome. So it was fun. It was, it was enjoyable. And we drove. Then we drove from central Ohio to uh shenandoah valley virginia which is like seven hours all right so you did six magazine features yeah so what are we Ooh. what are we looking at upcoming? uh so we shot we shot with a gentleman by the name of shay alexander at his shop um and we've also been working with a, a guy by the name of albert klein um who happens to be good friends with shay so albert drove the two hours from dc to also work out of Shay's shop for a week. So um, Shay and his brothers run a company amazingly called Alexander Brothers. Um, they have a sawmill, a lumber yard. They don't own a sawmill. So Shay contracts with loggers to buy logs, um, tells them what he's looking for. They'll buy, they'll log them. He'll buy them, have a lumber or a sawmill cut them. And then Shay dries them and sells them. They have a lot of really nice stuff. Um, hmm. So Shay and his brothers have started putting together chair kits for um, Lost Art Press. So if you go to Lost Art Press oh, and order yeah. chair kits, you're ordering them from Shay and his brothers. Um, and then he would he had some like, I mean, you should have seen these pine boards that Shay had up in his lumber yard. Like he had some like 24, 25 inch wide, four quarter, five quarter yellow pine boards that he's like, he's cutting a lot of this stuff for, um, you know, Megan has a tool chess class she's doing. So it's like, you know, all those guys from Ohio are ordering stuff from him. He has some weird stuff. He has some really cool stuff. Um, but it's, it's very interesting because Shay's a businessman and he's very much like, if it's not moving, he doesn't stock it, hmm. which is, is interesting. Cause to me as a small guy, I'm like, Oh yeah, give me that little weird stuff, you know, like, it's cool to have like that little spalted birch, you know, because where else are you going to get it? Um, right. But on, on that note, Shay will also find stuff. If you like, if you're like, Hey, I need, you know, 
10 quarter curly cherry that's 20 inches wide he'll have it give him a couple weeks he'll have it um which is pretty cool um so and then so they have the the lumber yard um one of shay's brothers does um custom leather working um like super oh. nice leather working right. um one of his other brothers is a like award-winning architectural blacksmith um, hmm. and then Shay does a lot of custom furniture. Um, so it, it's this weird little, like, it's not weird. It's this cool little, like, uh, kind of crafts center, but it's Shay and his brothers. Um, so back to, <laughs> back to what we were shooting. Um, I've followed Shay's work for a couple of years now on line, um, Facebook, Instagram, stuff like that. Um, and Shay does a lot of think of like, Galbert style carving or Fallensby style carving um, where it's like, you know, kind of like green woodworking, rusticy carving, but like high scale type stuff. Um, so Shay's done a lot of that type of carving on chairs, on stools, on boxes, stuff like that. So uh, what we shot with Shay was we did a full carving article, kind of some, some simple, carving techniques that you do with two or three different chisels, the gouges, sweeps. Um, we did a three-legged stool, so an octagon leg, three-legged stool. Um, pretty much all hand tools on that guy. Um, and then we did a little carved flip-top lid box um, that had uh, kind of a geometric carving on the front. Um, hmm. And that was a lot of hand tools as well. Um what what I appreciate about Shay's stuff is he's not, he's very much a like, I'm making money doing this, so I need to be efficient about it. So he's not like, I only use hand planes because they're the best way. He's like, he's like, no, nah, I'm gonna rip it on the bandsaw then just touch it up with the hand plane. Like he's the epitome of like somebody that's making a living doing this. Sure. So he's very diligent about how he does stuff. Um, and it's funny for the three days we're shooting, it's like customers walking in the front door. He has to go help them. Uh, phones ringing off the hook. Cause you know, like loggers have questions. His sawmill is like, Hey, what did you want these cut at? Yada, yada. Um, so that was, that was funny just to kind of watch him run his operation as, as we were working. Um, and then with Albert, it's funny. These two guys could not be like any, any more different. Um, you know, Shay is Shenandoah Valley. Him and his wife met doing humanitarian work in Haiti. He lived in Haiti for six years, just kind of doing humanitarian work, like just like side of the earth type people. Right. And then you got Albert who is lives in DC. He is an economist. I don't think I have a single picture of him without like a corn or in, you know, uh, insane clown posse t-shirt on, uh, his vans are in every photo, probably. Like, I mean, just like '90s skater boy. Um, but the guy is Jinko jeans. The guy, J uh, oh yeah, oh we, oh trust me, we made the Jinko jean joke like plenty <laughs> of times. Uh, but like, like, and just to kind of tell you the type of guy that that Albert is, Shay's brother that does metalworking has one of Albert's. Um, number four and a half Lee Nielsen's that he has sandblasted and he's powder coating lime green and putting like white handles on it. Or maybe he's powder coating it white and putting lime green handles on it. Like the guy, like he's just, he's a character. He is just a character. Um, but he is also a phenomenal marketry expert. Like the guy is so good. He just is fit. He just is, uh, working on final corrections for his first book with, um, Fox Hill, I think, or, yeah, I think Fox Hill um, on a marketry book. So with uh, with Albert, we did an entire Mox and Vice build. Um, okay. That happened to have two little um, dogwood flower um, marketry pieces on it. That wasn't really part of the article. We showed putting the panels in, but then we did a full dogwood marketry panel. Uh, and then um, we did a little dovetailed flip lid box so yeah it, it was a great week it was a productive week um 
I was kind of had a little heartburn on going into it because I'm like, oh god, we got we have a lot to shoot this the these three days. I mean, I had I had Colin there to help because of how much we had to shoot, and he was catching a lot of video on this stuff. Um, after Monday, I was like, oh, we're like we're we're cooking right along, like no issues, and then like. Wednesday morning, the last day of shooting, I'm like, oh god, I hope we get this stuff done. <laughs> so it was like this just roller coaster of like, are we gonna get it done? Are we not? Um, we did. It was great. It was I I will say I think Shay's shop is one of the most photogenic shops I've ever shot in. And Shay is one hundred percent different than I am, where he is very much a like, you know what? If I don't use it in a week, I'm not going to have it in my shop. So, oh, okay. So there's very, very like, doesn't have a router table. He has a shaper, doesn't have a router table. Um, it's like, I just don't do that much work with a router. Um, he did have a lot of vintage machinery, which was really cool. He had a really, he had a beautiful Wadkin joiner. Um, he had a old Delta table saw his drill press was one of the old powermatic 1150s um yesterday colin and i flew back but shay was going to pick up a restored northfield bandsaw Hmm. um so there's a lot of cool vintage machinery um but yeah it it was it was it was a very very good photo shoot so so you just come back to your shop and then just take several deep breaths and close your eyes and get rid of stuff <laughs> <laughs> my shop is bigger but um humble yeah, brag just well no 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 no. <laughs> he has an upstairs so technically square footage he probably has more his office and his brother's leatherworking studios upstairs i am on the uh i'm on the hunt now for a uh good hackberry lug that i'm gonna saw and ship down to him Oh, so okay, because they—I guess—they don't have hackberry. They have every every freaking type of tree you could ever imagine in Virginia. He said they have twenty-eight harvestable species of oaks in his area. Okay, they don't have real big hackberry. So I feel like that part of the country you get because of the mountains. Yeah, that are relatively close by. You get a little bit of the northern forest dipping down. Plus, it's warm enough that you Country would get. Roads. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's taking you home. home. Mm-hmm. <sighs> John didn't get his Plus, medicine today. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you get a lot of the, you know, mid coast hardwoods. Yep. Probably some of the southern stuff where there's a little some of the hardier species of that would come up, and yeah, I could see where yeah. that would be a pretty good, pretty good mix in the area. Yep. Yep, he said their cherry. He he pulls a lot of his cherry from Pennsylvania. He has, if there's anything I'm envious of, it's the the cherry that they have. They have beautiful cherry. Um, because our cherries here, I think I've said this before, they get about twenty inches and they just get hollow. Hmm. Um, but their cherries, he had three curly cherry logs sitting there. Um, that his brother took to the sawmill while we were while we were there. That were, I mean, they were every bit of 24 inches and, and wow. they had deep curl throughout them. So it's like, hmm, don't have those. Yeah. So what is it that makes their cherry better? Just better forest uh, around it or? Doesn't get as cold. Oh. So he said that the, uh, the Virginia cherry isn't as good as the Pennsylvania cherry. So they pull a lot of their cherry from Pennsylvania. Which I would think the, Pennsylvania uh, would get cold, though, too. It does. And he said that the best cherry comes from the higher elevations in Pennsylvania. But we get a lot of dry rot in the center. Yeah. Um, he did say that the Virginia cherry, much like ours, um, I, I would say our cherry and the Virginia cherry is pretty similar. Okay. Um, but the uh, the Virginia cherry, like ours, gets a lot of those uh, pitch pockets and resin streaks in it kind of those darker, you know, yeah. red, ruddy brown streaks, um, which I really like. I would love to find somebody that is culling out a bunch of, like, resin streak cherry because I love that look. Um, yeah. It's like ambrosia maple. They have a ton of ambrosia maple. 
and we do not get any. Um, and it, all their their soft maple that they get is a red maple, where ours is mm. all silver maple. So, right, it's just it's very it's very different. Cool. Yep. All right. On last week's episode, uh, had Dylan sitting in for you, and he had been or had been designing quite a number of uh, plywood shop projects. So he kind of took a little deep dive on his design process recently as he's been thinking about plywood. So in light of that, and then John was talking about uh, his process for getting parts ready and buying lumber for TV show projects, since he does a lot of that prep work for us to get get us started. Um, so I was thinking, Logan, in in a how it's made sort of way, when you're conceiving a project for popular woodworking, mm -hmm. and this could be a furniture project or shop project, like what what are some of the things that you're thinking about, both in project design wise and how it needs to be for a magazine. Cause I feel like those can sometimes be complementary and competing interests. They can, um, there's a fine line. So I'm a very straightforward, like when I, when I come up with a design for something, I'm very straightforward with the, the design, like the quickest from point A to point B, you know, generally is what I'm going to do. So, you know, if it's like there's an angle joint, like, yeah, you can do an angle tenon, or I could just cut a slot mortise and throw a loose tenon in there. Like that's when it comes to joinery and stuff, I, I tend to look at it like that. Um, mortise and tenons. Sure. Solid. Great. That's what I'm going to do. Um, but there's always this weird thing with, having the magazine involved that you have to have enough content there. Like, you know, there, there's always, we have, X, we have X number of pages we have to fill for popular woodworking, woodsmith and shop notes and fine woodworking. So if I am designing, if I'm looking at a project, you know, a box project, for example, box projects are pretty simple. They're small scale. Sometimes they can be super intricate, you know, like the puzzle boxes and stuff like that. But generally there needs to be something that, you know, somebody could talk about, um, you know, so this, this little Norwegian linen chest I just did, it's a rabbited box, like doing a rabbited box. We could show how to do that in two pages. Like that's right. easy. Um, that's not hard. Um, so if it, if it's something I'm designing and making, I need something in that project to be interesting. And again, and I've said this before, like, I don't ever care if somebody builds our projects out of pop wood, like, if it doesn't appeal to you, great. That's fine. Like, but what I want you to do is I want you to say, Oh, this certain aspect of that project was interesting. And I didn't know that's how that was done. So I'm going to file that in my, you know, Rolodex, my meat Rolodex. So I can remember that down the road. Right. Um, so like that little Norwegian chest, it's a curved top trunk. So like the top is two pieces. It's coved on the table saw with a, you know, angle jig the top is then curved. It has a bead on it. So you're cutting the beads by hand. Like there's a lot of intricacies to that top that make it a um, more of that's going to be the bulk of the project is that top. So I'm trying to design projects that are simple, have simple aspects of them. And the framework of them are pretty simple and straightforward but there are one or two techniques out of the project that you're really concentrating on in the article. And, you know, that's where it's different between, you know, like in Woodsmith, we would try to generally break that out into a separate department, like, you know, uh, right. coves on the table saw, like, and that would be an entire department that we would show how to set up a jig, how to make a jig, how different radiuses and angles create different, you know, uh, coves. Um, so yeah, I mean that's kind of how I how I approach the actual building of it. The design is a little different, and I'll be the first one to tell you. I've been really playing with like 
AI design lately because it is interesting. It's like, okay, like I have I have an idea in my head. I'm going to spit it into an AI generator and see what it gives me. And I might pick out like two or three details out of a couple of different designs and work those in. Um, I did that with a, um, a wall hanging cabinet. Um, I, I told, I told AI, like, you know, design me a wall hanging cabinet made out of Oak based on, you know, the Rohirrim style out of the Lord of the Rings movies, just to see what it would give me, (laughs) like just to see. And it's phenomenal some of the stuff that that gets spit out of there you know so it's like oh that's kind of a cool little design element like that's not a shape that i thought would work but looking at it visually i can see that it works you know um so you know i i i'll be the first one to tell you like i don't i hate coming up with designs from scratch and i i think i don't think most designers do either it's like you know hey i need to build a fly tying table so i'm going to start looking at google images of flying tying tables and picking elements out of cert out of already made designs right everything's built on something that's been made in the past sure um so yeah i mean that's kind of it's kind of how i approach stuff whether it's shot made or or for a shot project or for cool. a um furniture piece for the house um you know, and I, I am contracting with a few designers. Um, one of the old Woodsmith designers, um, Ken Munkle, is going to do some design work for me for some pop wood stuff because there's a whole different aspect of having to get that design into the computer to where we can publish it, right? Sure. So, like, John and Dylan and Chris, they're designing in... Um, they're designing in Inventor. Inventor. Yep. Um, I've done stuff in SketchUp. Um, I have Ken putting stuff together in in Venter. Um, and it, it's interesting because him and I kind of sat down and can paper sketch, you know, napkin sketch the designs that we're talking about. Um, but I don't really know what it's going to end up looking like until I get a model from him. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. John, did I talk long enough that you lost your joke for the meat Rolodex? No, I'm still. Th- that's the thing. It's All right, been good. like three right. or four minutes, and I'm. I know. Still I've been trying just to keep going. <laughs> I'm thinking about it still, like a, a Rolodex in my fridge that has deli meats in it that are alphabetized. It's like <laughs> salami, ham, turkey. It's like yeah, it's not a joke. It's like, is this a real thing? Right. Like, is this a concept? Or should it be? <laughs> I, I mean, do they sell these meat Rolodexes? <laughs> I can't stop thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to check out. I'm done for mm-hmm. the day. Got to yeah. go find a me Rolodex. Today's episode is brought to you by Epilogue Laser. Quickly and easily customize your woodworking projects for added beauty and value. Learn more at epiloguelaser.com. I mean, it would be perfect for like a like a get together for watching a football game or something like that. You could just yeah. do like a sandwich bar with a meat yeah. Rolodex it's, on it. It's all alphabetized right there. Yeah. Maybe the condiment Rolodex. Mm-hmm. Cheese. Toppings. Yeah. Could have different one with, with cheese different Rolodex. cheeses on there. Yeah. I was, saying, I was thinking we're, we're Rolodex. workshopping this yep. guys. Yep. There are reasons why we're not food designers. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the best ideas come from the outside, though. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Just got to color outside the line sometimes and see what happens. Yep. It was very fascinating for anybody who's watching this on the YouTubes for if you go back like three minutes or whatever, mm-hmm. when Logan says the word meat Rolodex, and then to just look, if there's a way <laughs> that you face. can blow up that image of John's yeah. face. As you can see, the wheels just cranking. Like, what? I, I, I hope Nate does a slow zoom where John's face just takes over the entire <laughs> screen. Right. Yeah. yeah. You could just yeah. I, pause it at that moment. Yeah. yeah. I watched John this whole time. It's just like <laughs> I knew he's it. got something going on in yeah. there that. You got to let it cook. <laughs> uh, speaking of which. This is very tangentially related. I saw Festool came out with, uh, what was it, a 10-bit set 
that's in like a revolving container. Mm. Okay. I shared it on the design on the design th- thread that we have here for teams, which I thought was kind of an interesting concept. It was like a little wheel shaped organizer for 10 different bits that you could load out on, which I thought was cool. And I'm kind of thinking of, is there a way to make a larger version for like a Tommy gun style canister (laughs) of bits a little bit, or, uh, sometimes you have, uh, a screwdriver set that has like a revolving thing with all the different shaped yeah. drivers, you know, that can pull out. It's kind of like that. So I'll put a, I'll put a link to that on the show notes page. Cause it's, it's those kind of things that I see sometimes. And it's like, what would a, a you know, feels like it's the starting point of a larger project much much the same way as a meat Rolodex. So. All right. So are you going to make any changes to your shop based on your trip out to Shays? No, I don't think so. Um, because, I mean, because everybody has different work habits, right? Right. Um, I guess where I was, what I was, you know, Relate it to Shays, but I think because of yeah. the nature of what you do for Pop Wood, you're seeing the insides of a lot of different people's shops. I am. And how does that inform what you do in your shop? Um, so the only thing that I would pick out of Shays that I would really, and I've, I've talked about this before, he has a little wood burning stove in there. And um, he said he basically heats that entire shop with the scraps off the miter saw. He's like, I don't bring split wood in. He's oh. like, everything I lop off the miter saw just gets thrown in a pile next to the, the wood burning stove. And it is, you know, it just runs off that. And it's a little, it's a more so it's a, uh, I think Swedish or Finnish made wood stove. Um, he's like, it pumps up a ton of heat. He's like, you know, and it's small. It's maybe only a foot wide by two foot long. It's small. Um, and his shop is, he told me the size of it, and I don't remember. Um, but it, uh, he's like, you know, it, the, we had a, they had a week last year that I asked him how cold it got in Virginia. Because it's like, you know, you're kind of in that mid-latitude of the U.S. So yeah. it can't get as cold as we get, but doesn't get as warm as like down south. And uh, he's like, you know, we had a week last year where it was zero degrees. Um, But he's like, you know, most of the time it's bouncing between the 30s and zero during winter. Okay. Um, But he said, like, you know, I'll get it up to, you know, 70 in the day and I'll come back in the morning and it will still be 60 degrees in there. I'm like, oh, that's Hmm. that's actually cool. Like, I would really like to I just don't have I don't have a good wall space left for that for a wood stove like that. Um. I liked how he had he had set up a lot of his electrical for his um, machines were all pretty much set up off of VFDs because it's all three phase stuff that he's running um, right. like I am um, a little bit different setup than I have. That's kind of interesting. And I might look at doing that. He had basically built the VFDs into big enclosures. Um, so that was cool um, from a workflow standpoint or shop workflow or anything like that. I don't think there's anything that I would really ness. I mean, it's, it's set up very similar. To us. I do like, he has his bench set up against the window. Okay. And he has a tool rack that spans in front of the window. It's just, a, it makes great looking shots. Um, Colin, and I kept joking cause we had one of our lights that we kept bringing outside and it was set up in the window outside facing in and it like it looks like the sun is just blazing through that window and it was making some <laughs> great shots so we kept saying oh we need to go bring the sun inside you know um and Slack out. yep and uh so that i i do like that setup it's not feasible for how i'm set up in here or it's not feasible for what i'm doing in here 
Um, you know, if there's ever a point where I'm not shooting photos and video in here, then I will probably put the bench up against the wall. Um, because I did, I did really like that setup. Um, he had an Emmert Patter Makers vice set up on his big like assembly table, and that made me really want to get my vice set up on the new bench, um, because it was really really nice. Um, but I, I guess more so what I took away is how he runs his lumber business. Like he doesn't have a sawmill, which is interesting to me. Right. Um, but like he's flipping and selling a lot of lumber. Yeah. Um, I'm like, okay, that kind of is interesting. Like there, maybe there are things I could pick out of that and actually buy green lumber from people and, and dry it. You know, that, that's going to require getting a kiln set up and stuff, which is the plan. It's just not this year. So, um, yeah. going back to the, uh, Swedish wood burning stove, do you know the brand? Because it could be now we cooking, <laughs> now we cooking. <laughs> All right, that's it. I'm out, folks. All right, see ya. <laughs> Thanks. There are an, uh, today. John holds the record here at Woodsmith for most days of suspended with pay, yeah. self imposed. <laughs> uh, I'll see myself out. <laughs> I was going to check because Logan had a photo of the wood burning stove. Yeah, I sent it to you guys. I think it's a Morso, M O R S O. I could be, I'm probably missing a letter or something in there. Um, he, I did. He also had a great dog, too, apparently. Oh, uh, well, his, so Shay's dad. So Shay's, I think, the oldest brother, I think. I, I could be wrong about that. Um, he's 20 or he was born in, uh, 91. Um, the dog It is a, no, oh. it is more so M O R S O is the brand M O R S O. There you go. Um, anyways, so Shay, Shay's, uh, Shay's youngest brother still lives at home. So his youngest brother, uh, runs the leather, leather side of the business. And he comes in one day, um, and he has this beautiful English pointer puppy with him, orange puppy. And when I got my Brittany, I was in between an English pointer and a Brittany. And so I got to play with Pete. Her name was Peaches. So I got to play with Peaches a little bit. And I was like, oh, what's your dog's name? He's like, that's my dad's dog. I was like, it's your dad's dog? Like, yeah, dad's at work. Like, oh, it's like, well, why do you have it right now? He's like, mom wanted it out of the house. <laughs> so, okay. Like, I'll, I'm fine with that. She did. She peed on my foot, so my dogs were not happy when I got home yesterday because <laughs> my 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 shoe smelled like dog pee. <laughs> Other like, dog she got excited. Are, yeah, but... she got it. She got excited. I I riled her up too much. That was that was my fault. That was not the dog's fault. But yeah. So no, it was it was good. Um, good trip. The uh, they are Shay is building a bigger shop. They added an addition to their lumber. Uh, yard building where they're going to move all of their stuff up to. It's just he has a lot of he has a lot of rods in the fire. So, you know, it was it's one of those it's like I know I know how you feel, man. So his uh <laughs> his Shay's daughter came out um one of the days and was hanging out there with us. She's four and a half. So I let her I got I pulled a stool up and I was, her name's Eden. I was like, Eden, you wanna come take pictures of your dad? So I put her on the stool and let her just snap pictures. <laughs> so I might have to put her name as the photographer for some of those photos. There we go. Contributing photographer. Yep. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. John, other than T V show stuff, you got anything that you're working on? No, still this T V show stuff. Yeah. Working hard, mm -hmm. you know, keep the talent happy. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty happy so long as you keep coming up with meat Rolodexes. Yep. So. <sighs> it's going to happen. I like the stove one better, personally. That was a good one, too. Yeah. Yeah. 
That one you could see come, coming up too. That was yeah. I, I know you can see like, the sparking. Like, oh, you can't hold this so oh, much longer. Hold it in. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. Let's see. I don't know that I have too much going on here. I have a big. Uh, I actually got this from you, Logan. A T-handled auger. Mm-hmm. I was looking for a two-inch T-handled auger for a while, and you had one. I don't even know where you got that one. I used it to drill in coyote and fox sets when I was trapping. There you go. Yep. Yep. So it just drilled a lot of dirt. Right. So the handle on it was, it appears to be some sort of oak painted green. Spray painted green. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But it also had a split in it so that when you're cranking on it, you could see a split open up under resistance that had been very expertly patched by wrapping copper wire around it multiple times. As one does. As one does. So I found uh, a pattern, not really a pattern, inspiration for making a new handle. Um based off of a vintage Pexto T-handle auger that, so I made it out of beach and it had turned knob or turned handles on the end. And then the middle section is square. And then on this Pexto one, they have uh, a kerf cut through it to help hold the bit. And then there are opposing carriage bolts and wing nuts that pinch it in place that will prevent the handle from splitting. So that's what I was basing my version off of. So I thought that did that one not have a hoop that the handle went through? No. No? Oh, okay. I thought that one had a hoop. Hmm. No, that that was a disappointing thing. We did not have time in Virginia to hit any antique stores because that's like the heart of tool country. Did yeah. not have time. Did I need it? No, absolutely no. not. No, but it's always fun. Like that yeah, when we if did you're there. That, yeah, we did that trip to Grizzly in September yeah. for their tent sale. And what was it like right across the street or right next door to Grizzly is like an antique same parking mall? lot. Yeah. Yeah. So a big one too. Yeah. Logan and I got there to Grizzly kind of checked in with everybody and then you knew about the antique store. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got there, what did we have like half hour, 20 minutes, like 45 minutes to get through this. We power walked like old ladies. Yeah. Yeah. It was, we mall walked it just basically just head on a swivel scan and up and down (laughs) for all kinds of stuff. And there was some fun stuff there and no doubt we passed over some things, but. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. But no, I, which drives me nuts living in the Midwest when you have a lot of folk writing about woodworking and they're on the East Coast yep, where there is a much longer history of work and a denser population for the most part. And they're like, all you have to do is just go to any antique store and you're going to find xyz sort of tool and you're like nice try dude yep <laughs> not here you won't yeah I, basically from here west you know yeah mm-hmm. like like from from the mississippi west it becomes a pretty hard barren place tools weren't manufactured there right people didn't necessarily bring tools with them when they moved that far and you just don't have as many cities yeah. that would you would have had that many craftsmen around for that long a period of time. Yeah. Plus all the good stuff's buried in some farmer's barn hayloft yeah. or something here. They're not they're not <laughs> yeah. getting rid of anything. They, oh no, they're not. Right. It's it's generational. Yeah. <clears throat> Which means that by the time you do end up seeing it, it's way far gone. It's mm-hmm. roached. Yeah. Absolutely roached. And a lot of the stuff that you find is usually 
I don't know, agriculturally flavored. Like if it's not, oh yeah, it it's all geared towards the operation of some kind of a farm. Even though yep. there are, you know, industrial cities, you know, Cedar Rapids, uh, Quad Cities, stuff like that. But it just yeah. those those towns came about after after hand tools were passing away. So there's just not yep. machine tools. You can find a ton of machine tools, but yeah. So, yep. The envy of the Midwest for the riches of vintage hand tools. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, sometimes you get lucky, but not very often. Yeah. All right. Looking for any of our listeners for a latest score that they've had for tools. Have you found a vintage power tool, a cast iron, something or other like uh, Logan has in his shop or a hand tool score that you picked up for a sweet, sweet deal? Send it to us. As always, the email woodsmith at woodsmith.com. You can also put it in the comment section on our YouTube channel. And a uh, special thanks to Epilogue Laser. They have a variety of tools and accessories to help you create customized projects as well as to make a business out of it, to offer uh, unique products to a wide array of customers. You can check it out, epiloguelaser.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Oh, I said RIP John Denver, right? Shenandoah <laughs> Valley. Yeah. West Virginia. Yeah. Western side of Virginia, not West Virginia. Let's yep. get it straight. Yep. <laughs> Mountain Mama. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to keep going? Yeah. No. Just <laughs> I want to see how far you can go here with this. Okay. <laughs> uh.